Hello, hello, hello. Thanks for joining us on the 10th episode of Ed Video's Open Circuit, streaming live every weekday at 2 p.m. from our super secret location here at Ed Video 404 York Road, Guelph, Ontario, Canada. That uh, intro music was by one of our members here, Evan Gordon, from his uh, musical project, his latest musical project called Sled, and that track was called Twice Scorned. If you've been watching this show normally, uh, my co-host and co-producer of this show, my daughter Edie, who uh, is today again at home, uh, just uh, feeling a bit tired, and uh, also having her own projects, catching up on her online learning modules uh, at, at home. And that's fine. The, the work is a, a lot for a nine-year-old to do. Uh, she's been doing such a good job. But we promise that she'll be back on Monday uh, with a new feature. Uh, we were trying to get her set up so that she could do live streaming. Um, with uh, with Arena, but I foolishly updated the OS on this 10-year-old Mac Mini, and now it can't take uh, Arena. Um, so we've got a few other ideas. Today I'm just running some generic visuals I prepped in the backdrop to try to make it a little little more interesting. Uh, so you don't have to. You can look at the backdrop, not not at me. Um, uh, the other thing Edie is going to do starting on Monday is do some uh, reviews of some online video games she's been playing. Um, she's found some really great ones that I'm trying hard not to play all the time. And we thought maybe it'd be fun to uh, show you what those are and, uh, show and uh, let you know where you can find them at home as well. So today I'll... We have a really special guest, someone I'm really excited to speak to uh, about her uh, many projects, in particular her video projects. I've been a big fan of hers in, for a long time. Her name's Ivana Dizdar. She's joining us uh, from Toronto today. I'll talk a little bit more about her. Um, there she is. Uh, there we are. There's there's Ivana. We're gonna do something a little different uh, today with uh, Ivana. We're gonna show some of her longer format videos, and I think when you see them, you'll realize why, because they're uh, they're just uh, incredible, very funny, really uh, great satires of uh, the contemporary art world. Uh, I'm I'm already going too much into depth because I'm a big fan of Ivana and her work. So let's talk though first before we find Ivana um, about some upcoming guests. Uh, this Monday, April 20th, we have Tasman Richardson, who I know has been watching the show. i um, extremely so excited to pick his brain about uh, how he thinks about video. Um, got some, he's got some very fascinating and very open-minded ways of understanding this, the nature of the medium he works with. April 21st, the great Orbax. Uh, he's a mon monster of schlock, and now him and his partner, Sweet Pepper Klopak, do science uh, shows and videos for kids. Uh, so many things to talk to about Orbax, a dear friend of mine for about 15 years, living here in Guelph, April 22nd. Someone else who used to live in Guelph now lives in Chicago, Amy Lockhart, the incredible animator and media artist. Uh, I uh, can't wait to, to get a bit weird with her, talk about her, what she's up to, and the way she thinks about what she's doing, because she's fascinating. April 23rd, Fez Stanton, uh, talking about some of his high-end video techniques for events, for VR, for AR, for all sorts of things. Then on April 27th, a, a dear friend of mine I have a kind of a bromance for, his name is Alejandro Garcia Contreras. He's going to uh, Skype in live from his residency in Chiapas, Mexico, show us a lot of his uh, sculptural work that's around the grounds of it and talk about what the art scene is like in Mexico. Then Versa Visuals, Versa, uh, right here from Guelph, talking about what they do on May 1st. And this just confirmed uh, yesterday, Dustin Seabrook, a local video artist who's uh, doing a series of videos uh, called uh, Project Isolation, or sorry, Isolation Project. Sorry, I'm mix. I'm mix one of those is right, uh, where people submit uh, videos of what they're up, been up to while they're during the current state of the world. He's editing those together into very, very beautiful and touching uh, short videos to showcase kind of everyday lives. Dustin's the kind of 
uh, video editor, he's got a real touch for it, and he knows how to take uh, any kind of uh, footage and make it just, just make it so beautiful that you almost want to burst into tears when you see it. So I'm excited to speak to Dustin on May 5th. So let me introduce uh, today's guest. Uh, I've known Ivana Dizdar for, I think, hmm, four, five, six years. Worked with her twice, I believe. Uh, she is a very fascinating uh, person uh, because she does a lot of things. She uh, uh, is an artist, a media artist primarily. She's a, uh, I would consider her a performer and potentially a comedian as you might see, but also she's a researcher, a curator, an academic, and a writer. She does so many things. We could talk for hours, but we don't have we don't have, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna focus on a few of her more recent projects and the dynamics uh, uh, around those. So please welcome, uh, Ivana Dizdar, there you are. How are you doing, Ivana? Oh, I, I don't, oh, hold on, there we go. Let's see, are you there? Gotcha, yes. forgot to just put that slider up. Sorry about that. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm good. How are you? I'm fine. I'm doing what I can here in Guelph. Um, so uh, tell us a little bit of, before we get going, like what have, what have you been doing in the last month or so since this has happened? Well, my life changed unexpectedly as did most people's. I, in response to the crisis, my building where I was living in New York City shut down completely unexpectedly. Suddenly I had about a day and a half to pack and move back to Toronto, which I'm really happy about. I'm here with my mom, so safe and well. And I've been working a ton. I've been uh, working on my art. I'm, I'm working currently as an assistant to two Italian curators in New York, Massimiliano Gioni and Cecilia Limani. So I'm actually working a bit on the Venice Biennale in 2021. And I'm writing and I'm just thinking a lot about what I want to do in the coming days in the near future. Okay. Yes. Well, I'm glad you're doing okay. And I'm very, very happy you got out of New York, escaped from New York, like that yes. movie was, uh, as it's a wonderful city. It's um, really been hit hard. And um, I was yeah. glad to, when you let me know that you were able to get out. Yeah. I'm watching the situation there unfold with a very heavy heart and uh, sending a shout out to my friends who are still there. I can imagine. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And uh, well, I'm going to start right away. As I said before, we uh, we have a little form, a different format, because we're going to mm -hmm. run some of your videos, uh, some of as excerpts, some as full length. Um, so a little bit more video. Um, and I thought it'd be great to uh, start right away with Bidding War, a, a video when I, I think this is the, my first introduction to your work. Um, I researched a lot of media artists when I saw it. I was like, wow, here we go. Here's something amazing uh, in its own style, high production and very, very uh, smart. Um, it's, uh, you made it with another uh, artist I know and admire, Alvin Luong. And yes. uh, when and this is maybe from uh, about three four years ago, something like that. Okay, okay. Let's just let's just play it out, and then we're gonna uh, we've got a lot of viewers here more than and for any other show, and um, so I'm not your only fan. And then we're gonna come back to you and uh, talk about it. Okay, so here's uh, ex good. excerpt from from uh, bidding war. pleasure to be here with you this evening, among the individuals and art lovers 
who make it their mission to nurture, promote, and advance Canadian art and artists both nationally and internationally. As a proud commercial art gallerist and a passionate advocate of the arts, it is my honor to accept this award. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with me tonight for my award ceremony. I'm so happy to be here, and I'm so honored to be here, to win this prestigious award again. It just, the words escape in my mouth. It's, it's, I can't describe how I feel right now. I'm so happy to be here, and I'm so humbled to be here. Thank you for sharing the night with me. I want to thank the committee for this award and for recognizing the people who make Canadian art great. The patrons, the donors, the collectors, the buyers, the boards of directors, the critics, the curators, and of course, the artists. You know, contrary to what the critics say, you can reinvent the wheel when you're with this company with strength, with speed, and with innovation. Both as an individual and the director and CEO of IDP, it is my top priority to support the arts because I believe the arts are the heart and soul of our communities. I'd like to thank my family tonight for contributing to the success of our company from the very beginning. Yep, back when Alvin Long Coyota and Linksys was just Alvin's Coyota. Through the exhibition and dissemination of contemporary art, we are paving the way for future generations, day by day and sale by sale. You know, I'll tell you something. There's a reason why I've won Quality Dealer of the Year five years in a row. Yeah. It's not because Luan Coyota and Linksys is the top grossing dealership in the country, in the continent. No. It's because I'm a leader. I'm a fighter. I'm a believer. And most of all, I'm a giver. I take very seriously my responsibility as a cultural leader. I live and breathe the mandate of Ivana Dizdar projects to use innovation and economic empowerment to make the Canadian art market thrive. Tonight isn't just a night to celebrate me and my award. No, because I got two announcements to make. I'm officially announcing my plans to move and relocate to a new property. And I'm so honored to be announcing a project that I've been working with my team for the past year. Next month, the Alvin Long Foundation, my new charitable organization, will be founded. I'm a very generous man. I would know that. I would also like to acknowledge the generous support of the following organizations and corporate partners. The Canadian Art Foundation, the Art Dealers Association of Canada. I'd like to thank uh, the Canadian Automobile Dealers Association. I'd like to thank the Ontario Dealers Association Merge. The North American Collector Society. The Ontario Association of Art Galleries. CNL Toronto, CNL Corporate. I'd like to thank uh, Linksys Manufacturing Company and Coyota Holdings Corporation. The International Commercial Art Alliance, the Ontario Arts Council, the Royal Bank of Canada, and last but not least, Y Plus Investments Incorporated. Last but not least, I'd like to thank my sponsor, TD Bank, for their commitment to fossil fuel and natural gas development. All these years representing artists 
and championing Canadian values have taught me that the only limitation to the height of your achievements is the reach of your dreams and the willingness to work hard for them. Thank you. I think I've seen that 10 times and I think I find it funnier each time. It's incredible. Um, wow. So, Ivana, please uh, tell us a little bit about this, the kernel of, of uh, the, the origin of, of this character, where you got the idea for to make a video like yeah. this. For sure. Um, I did. I also was laughing when you said that this was looked like a high production value work. I can almost hear Alvin chuckling from his apartment in Toronto because we had almost no budget at all, very few resources. It was the whole thing was very much fake it till you make it. We just reached out to as many people as possible who somehow were crazy enough to agree to be part of this project by these two emerging artists that nobody knew yet at the time. So I guess I'll use this opportunity also to thank those people, some of whom are really big deals who just, you know, took a leap of faith and decided to put their names in this project. Um, but origins, yeah. So we were approached, Alvin and I, as you mentioned, great friend of mine, great artist and occasional collaborator of mine by Y Plus Contemporary, which at the time was a very new baby gallery in Scarborough. And they wanted us to do a show we knew we wanted to do something site specific and given the fact that the art gallery had been converted from an auto shop it somehow struck us that we should make an exhibition about two fictional characters a high-end car dealer and a high-end art dealer and under the premise or the plot of the exhibition these two characters would be fighting to acquire a property that is actually the strip mall where the gallery was located in Scarborough and kind of in accordance with gender stereotypes and also racial stereotypes we decided that Alvin would be the car dealer and I would be the gallerist and so I guess that's really where the character was born and where she began developing but I think in hindsight the seed had actually been planted a couple years earlier when I was working for a woman in Toronto who was a lot like Meryl Streep's character in The Devil Wears Prada. I'm not even kidding. I, I think I was really inspired unknowingly at the time by her style, the hair and the pearls and her mannerisms, her attitude, even more so by her way of speaking, this kind of political rhetoric, these fluffy words, this um, empty language in essence saying a lot but not really saying anything you know what I mean and most of all I was inspired by this kind of person who uses art and philanthropy as a means to a self-promotional end and of course later when I moved to New York I became increasingly inspired as I encountered more and more people who were even more that way and who were even wealthier and less in touch with the real world so I definitely found in New York a lot of material, good sources for material to include in my in my work. And I think from the beginning, this character really resonated with people precisely because I think most of us have had an Ivana Dizdar in our lives. <laughs> yes, well, I, we'll talk a little bit more about that last point in specific later in this show. I mean, it's just fantastic satire because it's, uh, you know, it, it incorporates so much reality They're, those are real art people that are well known in Canada um, and I think uh, anyone who's even dabbled a bit into the uh, more professionalized art community can really relate to this sort of uh, corporate attitude that uh, permeates even here at a artist run center like a video we feel like a lot of pressure to really professionalize and uh, you know get get kind of corporate you know and it's a uh, mm -hmm. pressure from different different places um so uh i think actually what we're going to do is roll your second video right now because then later our conversation can encompass both of these uh both of these videos uh together um 
Uh, so uh, now we're going to take a look at a, an ex excerpt for about four or five minutes from uh, one of the two versions of your from your IDP series. This one is uh, IDP Africa. Uh, so let's take a look, and we'll be back with Ivana, and we'll talk about more in depth about uh, about some of the ideas uh, in her work. meeting because there's something I want to share with you. Uh, I've been working with my primary advisors, my board of directors, and my core staff on something that is a very significant step for the gallery, as you know. Um, it's a really, really big move forward. So here it is. IDP will be expanding. Woo! Fantastic. Oh, yes. And the expansion will be um, twofold. It will be temporal. So as you know, we've mostly collected modern and contemporary art up until this point. But I'm excited to begin collecting both ancient and pre-modern art, um, both tribal and civilized. Thanks. And um, secondly, this is the biggest news. We will be expanding to Africa. Wow. A new location in Ugandia by May of 2020. I always wanted to go to Africa. A great culture. Okay. Great. Anyway, so I'm very excited about that, and I wanted to let you know, of course, this is uh, very private, uh, confidential information that we will be releasing to the public in the next six months. Mm -hmm. So I'm only telling very select uh, groups of people. Um, of course. We keep it to ourselves, and up until that point, we'll discuss some of the details of the process. We'll be part of a long and strong tradition of Western museums in uh, the Eastern world. I kind, of, I kind of wanted to bring in a few examples of museums that I think we should really look up to in spaces, like for instance, the Rova, um, which was first owned by royalty and then colonizers and then the prime minister. And this kind of proves that, you know, an art museum should, should always be in good hands. And I think that IDP are, is those hands right now. This is our time to, to become a place where business and art and culture come together in a really beautiful way. Look, I'm gonna have to interject here. I'm not gonna lie, Africa, uh, you know, it fascinates me. Um, so really I wanna know more, you know, why, why Africa? Um, I don't think everyone necessarily mm -hmm. shares my uh, interests. So can you explain a bit more about that? Oh, of course, I mean, um, you know, I was, I was thinking about um, our new interest in, in tribal art and, and, and with introducing primitive art into the collection and speaking with my mentor at the Met, Sheldon Winter, he said, you know, why not go all the way? Why not go really tribal? Mm. And so I thought, well, well, what better place to do that than, than to go to Africa? It's a really... Um, authentic return to, to our, our roots, you know? Right. Um, and secondly, I'm just, I'm really excited to bring a piece of North America and Western culture to the third world. I think it's really, it's, it's all about giving back for me, okay. you know? Something I've always believed in is that with great wealth uh, and, and great power, um, and great intellect, frankly, comes, comes great responsibility. And so it's our duty to give back to, to the developing world. And, and I want to specifically invest in, in Africa and Uganda. I just think it's really important. Don't you agree? Absolutely. absolutely. I, think it's, I think it's great what, you, what you're doing here with IDP. So when you were saying earlier about the social dimension and how you're saying we have to invest in Africa, what are really the, the core benefits that we're bringing to this area when we put together mm -hmm. there? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I mean, there are both local and national benefits to the new institution, certainly, um, from cultural tourism to employment, especially for the, you know, the low-income majority. Um, you know, we have small and large business growth, um, third-party investments, and offshore banking. All right, all right. <clears throat> let's uh, 
Let's just cut that a little bit uh, short there. And uh, oh, hold on, where are we here? Oh, sorry, I, I faded to black and I forgot to bring it up. That can happen. We're doing live video here. So that was a, a short excerpt from uh, IDP Africa, S sort of a sibling piece to, uh, to the video, the proper IDP that we'll watch near the end of the show. Um, but again, that's uh, in the same tone as bidding war in, a, in its uh, heavy satire and whatnot. Um, what, is, what is your interest in how the art world plays into like the big themes of like globalization or uh, class, labor, things like this? Mm -hmm. What are you? Uh, what are, What are you? Uh, what are your thoughts about that, Ivana? Mm -hmm. Well, the one major departure from Bidding War, apart from stylistically, which is pretty clear, this one was even lower budget, shot on my iPhone by my friend Dylan uh, with victims who I found in my graduate residence that were forced to be actors. But I'd say the main departure is the fact that I developed an interest in globalization, neocolonialism, and more specifically, the idea of the international franchise model, which a lot of museums and galleries have begun to adopt, especially in the last several years. And I was interested in it. My, my goal wasn't necessarily to make a cr definitive critique against it, but rather to approach this work as a kind of research where I was asking an open question. And I, I hope that comes across because I'm not, uh, I don't want to give the impression that I think this stuff is purely bad. On the one hand, you know, she is going to a fictional third world country, quote unquote, in Africa and opening a gallery. Her claim that this venture will create new jobs and tourism and boost the economy is a valid claim, at least. But on the other side, she it's clear that she knows very little about this country and its people. It's almost like she, she Googled Africa and based all of her text on what it said on the very first page in the first entry and decided to play this kind of savior figure where she's going to do these very colonial things like educate the population and um, and then obviously invest in research and AIDS, which is the most obvious thing she could possibly do. And I, yeah, I just started going to more talks and listening to the kinds of people who were involved in gallery and museum expansion and listening to what they were saying and incorporating their texts into my speeches. So that line that I think is probably my most famous line, both tribal and civilized, that's actually sourced directly from a curator at the Met. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And uh, she also does this thing that a lot of people do that I love, which is to treat Africa as though it's one homogenous country uh, instead of a, a very diverse continent. Um, so I've definitely tried to play that up as well. Well, it's very fascinating because uh, a lot of times uh, people... In the in involved in the art world, don't really understand the the both sides of the effect of what they're involved in. And uh, I mean, I, I kind of feel like that when I write grants, uh, where I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth, where you really just focus on like the positive ideas of it. But uh, there are it's far more complex than that. Uh, mm -hmm. How an art art organization functions in its community, what it perpetuates. Uh, I mean, a lot of it is uh, very positive, but there, there's also like uh, diff other dynamics at play too that you just conveniently uh, omit uh, a lot of the time. It's, it's funny that you say that. I actually feel the opposite, at least from an artist's perspective. I feel like a lot of artists only concentrate on the negatives and are trying very hard to be critical of something, which is obviously very important. But then they run the risk, I do this too, uh, you run the risk of uh, flattening something into a purely negative thing. And there's just always two sides to every coin. So I'm trying to really remember that as I make this work. Well, talk to me now a little bit about how you see yourself as an artist as far as like you're, you know, participating uh, directly in the system, mm -hmm. but you're also parodying it and critiquing it. Um, mm -hmm. How do you think about that? Are you trying to create change from within or are you trying to mm -hmm. just bring, rip that system down? Or uh, how do you see your own role in, in that dynamic? Mm -hmm. 
That's a great question, Scott. I, you said on the show a couple days ago that a lot of people are very suspicious of contemporary art and that I think you use the word because it's snobby and difficult to access. And I completely agree with you. I feel that way about art 100%. I have this internal conflict because I love it so much. It, it really motivates me and turns me on intellectually. And then on the other hand, I just, I think it's kind of stupid at the same time. So I, am I trying to tear it up from the inside? I mean, to an extent, I think we're always on the inside of whichever institution we're critiquing, whether we're literally employed by a museum or uh, discussing and addressing what's going on in the museum. You can't really be outside of that world entirely. So I feel like in that sense, yes. And I feel also, you know, this is a really hard question. It's, I love it. It's a great question. There's a million ways I could answer this, but I guess by being this character, I can really be part of this world in a way that I wouldn't be able to be as myself. I'm this like young brunette, recent graduate student who has all these ideas about the art world and the ways in which it should change. But when I'm this character, by the way, mind you, I almost never go to openings as myself. I almost always go as Ivana Dizdar with the wig. <laughs> when I go to these openings and events, I have conversations that I would never ever have as myself. I'm privy to information that I would never be as myself. And people tell me things that they would never normally tell me. So in that way, it's like I have access. I have a platform that I wouldn't ordinarily have. And it does allow me probably to do something different from within. But I think that's a question I'm still struggling with and constantly thinking through. And the real answer is I don't know the answer yet. Well, if you know, please tell me. <laughs> I, I don't know the answer. And I, I in my own way, I think I think about that a, lo a lot as well. Because, I mean, I, I want to affect change in the way I, I guess it makes sense to me to make art more relevant and more exciting or yeah. better or, or in, in different ways, more equitable in, <clears throat> in, 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 and, and have more effect, I suppose. And, and to, yeah. as a curator, to do a, to essentially to make artist dreams mm -hmm. come true in whatever exactly. ways I can do that. But as far to further that last question I asked you, how do you think of it? Uh, um, you know, you're actually using your own name, but you're also playing a mm -hmm. character. Uh, I mean, where, where does, mm -hmm. you know, where does that slider mm -hmm. go uh, for you? Yeah. A lot of people wonder this. Uh, in fact, some of my colleagues and professors even warned me against using my own name because it thought they thought it would jeopardize my career and my practice in some way. And they're not far off. I'll give you an example. One curator that I've since worked with a couple times, uh, before he met me, he looked me up on online and on social media. And what came up was Ivana Dizdar, the blonde. And he thought, why on earth is this middle-aged, wealthy, commercial art gallerist reaching out to me what could we possibly work on together it just doesn't make sense as a collaboration and he merely declined the meeting so these kinds of things probably have happened more than I even know but I will say that it has been really important for me to take that risk and use my own name I think because mostly because it's an extension of the fact that I'm attempting to use my whiteness as a way to address the way that people navigate through the world and climb social and political and professional ladders by virtue of their identity markers. So if I'm using my face and I'm using the fact that I'm a white woman, I English is my first language, I'm educated, all these things, I might as well use my name as well. Although interestingly, my name is not, it doesn't really quite fit. It's not a standard settler colonial name it's an eastern european name and so i i kind of love the the awkwardness of that it just feels a little bit wrong <laughs> and uh, uh how do you use these projects as like a, a form or an excuse for your own research i mean obviously you're uh these are i i disagree with alvin i think they're highly crafted as far as the standards of media art go in canada at least um how, tell us about uh, you know what how you're researching this to develop these characters, mm -hmm. the scenarios, and even the production mm -hmm. of your projects. Mm -hmm.
Well, there's, of course, the research that I do, the academic research. For instance, I studied, I did a, a master's at the Sorbonne, and I was in Paris right at, pretty soon after uh, President Macron had commissioned a report on African restitution. So I'm always paying attention to these kinds of debates, and it's inevitably influencing my work. But I think the primary form of research is really just watching people and hearing the ways people speak, the rhetoric, the speeches, the conversations, a lot of which are overheard, and just integrating this because there's no better comedy than real life. And so many of the things these people say, Scott, you wouldn't even believe they sound like parody. They sound like straight out of a a satire and they're just not and so sometimes I don't even need to rewrite things I actually just put them word for word in my videos I'd say that's the most important form of research yes yeah, so I've met a few of these people in my uh, adventures in the art world too uh, definitely coming from a whole other um, world that's uh, created through uh, generally through extreme wealth or through posing mm -hmm. uh, as mm -hmm. many artists feel pressure to to be like those people um, mm -hmm. I mean, I've, there's always these hilarious things that happen where you're, say, traveling for some art exhibition with a group. And, you know, there's, there's like this weird formula. It's like, let's go to this stupidly expensive and slow restaurant okay. that no one can really afford. And then uh, we're going to go to this really standard like nightclub after. And like there's, all, there's sort of like this performance that happens in real life anyways totally. uh, within these totally. circles. And you can just tell like nobody wants to be yeah. there. Like uh, it's, yeah. not, it's not what they're about. It's not it's not who they are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, everyone's always pretending to be something i'm not saying that i am a hundred percent myself all the time as even at these that are the brunette but yeah this you're right there is a pressure around performing i even my bosses wanted me to get a visa so i could stay in the u.s and i spoke to a lawyer and the lawyer told me that the best way to get this specific kind of visa was to essentially get famous and the way to get famous was to go to as many openings as possible and be in pictures with other celebrities and be in art forum and that was more important than the writing and the work and what I was actually doing and to me that's just it's just not who I am I feel like I have to keep my integrity and if I'm gonna do it it's only gonna be as Ivana does or the wand yeah, I, I sympathize, I suppose, whereas like it's like a like a movie, for example, like when you hear the budget, like a enormous part of that is actually just the marketing. And if you just market any piece of garbage the right way, it can find uh, success. And it's sort of indicative of the American value mm -hmm. system where it's not really like being it's telling uh, is is the real currency in a situation mm -hmm. like that. But I mean, you're really harnessing really? that. I, you're harnessing that idea in an incredible way uh, to really flip it on its back and expose it in a way that not. I don't see a lot of people. Uh, I mean, I see people trying to make the style of videos, but to this level. In fact, I think when I first uh, uh, saw your work, I saw an, uh, an older video that you made. And what was it? It's about the fictional performance artist named uh, Ava Avazar. Avazar. Yeah. Uh, I didn't really get it <clears throat> that this was not a real. Uh, I didn't realize this was parody uh, until about halfway through the video. Um, so, I mean, that's the very best kind that really cuts to the bone of uh, an issue mm -hmm. there. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about, like, the ethics, though, of uh, pursuing work like that? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you know, you're speaking, you know, from uh, quite honestly and, and about, like, your position of some privilege to do this. and But you're mm -hmm. also, like, poking fun at that own, at your own mm -hmm. privilege. And, you know, uh, how, how, does, how do you think about th those ideas as far mm -hmm. as, like, you know, what, what you have the license to do and what works. Totally. Well, if you don't mind before touching on the ethics, I will just say in case whoever hasn't seen the original version of IDP Africa, which was very, very different than this. I am constantly reinventing the character and she's changed a lot in the f last few years. So the first iteration of IDP Africa I made was very absolutely obviously a parody no question about it. It starts out as this promo video. She's announcing her expansion to Africa. And then a minute later, a cake appears on screen. Her face is on it. This like traditional African drum beat comes in. And then pretty soon she's talking about how she's going to build a zoo and a resort and an airport and a theme park on the premises of her gallery. And she's digging her hands into the cake and 
and consuming it in this really wild way. Don't, and so, don't spoil it. We're gonna watch it later. Jeez, don't I know. Give it away. Uh, well, I haven't spoiled it completely. <laughs> I think it's. It, <laughs> I'll stop. I'll stop there. But the reason I bring this up is because people people loved this work because it's fun and it's funny and it certainly makes a point. But I spent a lot of time after I made it thinking about it and agonizing over whether it had been the right approach. And I came to the conclusion that no, it wasn't. And the reason is that by making her out to be so absurd, it implied that A, she was crazy, which she wasn't, quite the contrary, she knows exactly what she's doing. And B, it implied that she's not really real, which isn't quite the case either. People exactly like her exist, and they're the ones running our systems of power for the most part. So I decided to go in a, in a different direction. I made her more sophisticated, I made her more subtle, and more. now the real struggle is finding that balance. Being awkward and, and inappropriate and even cringy, but never quite crossing that line so as to be really obviously a parody. Uh, and that's a hard balance to find. And the reason I bring this up is because it brings up an, a new ethical concern for me, which is by seeming more real, do I unwittingly perpetuate the issues that I'm critiquing? And I'd love to hear what you think, or anyone who's watching. It's it's something that I second guess a lot and and want to make sure that I'm doing right. From my opinion, I don't I don't think so, because uh, I mean, p potentially someone who has very, very little interest or involvement in the contemporary art world might see it and like me be tricked by it and just think, oh, what a mm -hmm. what a I knew those people were jerks, you know, and it might do that. But I, I don't really think that's the case. I think that it definitely rides in strong enough. Uh, into this territory where you know it's uh, a parody of something going on. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, again, it's this perfect parody because it is really, it has to ride that line, you know. Mm -hmm. um, humor is always such an amazing way to really uh, get to the core of something because you're, you're tricking people into thinking about it, you know. A lot of artists, mm -hmm. I, I think uh, what I would uh, say to them is if I if their work isn't really resonating the way they want it to be is because they're not wrapping their politics enough in poetry they're not they don't there's mm -hmm. no uh, there's no shell on the candy that makes them get to the gushy inside mm -hmm. you know and spend mm -hmm. time with it um, but I, I, I think yours your your video work does an excellent job mm -hmm. uh, with that but uh, <clears throat> to you know I would also like to speak a little bit about, I think, what is some of your more recent uh, research, uh, kind of uh, looking into the intersection of uh, the contemporary art world and law. Is this, what, what have mm -hmm. you been uh, discovering as you uh, explore that issue? Yeah, so that's exactly right. Art and law is a huge interest of mine and increasingly so, and it's where I see my practice going my art practice as well as my writing and curatorial practice in many ways. And when I say art and law, I don't really mean art about law or law that's about art, meaning like entertainment or copyright or any of that, though I do find all of that fascinating. What I mean is art that instead of using paint or plaster, uses actual laws and policies as material. I find it fascinating the fact that you can you can manipulate these things and as an artist actually make some kind of concrete mark on the real world. I'll give you an example. I wrote my graduate thesis, among other things, about an artist who's Serbian who married a German man for EU citizenship. This is a, a prime example of what I'm talking about. So it is both a performance and a work of art, but it's also a real thing happening in real life where she's manipulating marriage law, essentially. Right. Right. <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm also curious if, uh, you know, a lot of the things you're critiquing, I think they, uh, you know, you, you're, you're like standing at the side shooting them with a, with a spitball, with a pea shooter. Mm -hmm. But I think really what happened in the last uh, six weeks is like a bulldozer 
uh, or, or a wrecking ball hitting them. You know, what <clears throat> sort of the uh, more high-end blue, blue chip uh, commercial mm -hmm. mega galleries and some of the medium-sized ones, I'm not so sure that they're going to fare too well out of this. Uh, uh, Jerry Saltz wrote a really fascinating article in The Vulture about three weeks ago, uh, still today, even though things change fast, holds a lot of water uh, about these impending changes to the uh, contemporary art world. <clears throat> what, what do you think this uh, global pandemic might do uh, to reassess the tone or the focus or mm -hmm. the value system of the contemporary art world that you're critiquing? That's a great question. I think that certainly art, the arts are one of the first things to suffer when something goes wrong in a recession, which is ironic because with everyone staying home, what they turn to for the most part is art, reading, podcasts, movies, etc. I think it will be really difficult. Uh, I can't speak so much you know, from an economic perspective what will happen with the galleries, though it does seem like the smaller the gallery um, the lesser chance to survive, for sure. Uh, if you are worried about Ivana Dizder, though, she will be just fine, because she is one of, she's, like, more on the level of Hauser and Worth, so <laughs> you will still be seeing her. And I think, if anything, her chances of doing really well in business will improve when the other galleries close. So here's hoping. I'm glad, <clears throat> I'm really glad to hear that, Ivana, because I was a little bit worried uh, for your enterprise. And I did notice that you, uh, in the video we're going to watch really soon, the original IDP, that you are slated to open in May 2020, and that's only in a mm -hmm. few weeks from now. So I'm glad your plans are, uh, are all uh, proceeding as normal. I mean, it's really wise for you to go into like super depressed economies to leverage your American dollars too. That really exactly. helps as well. So, exactly. so I'm glad you're going to persevere and do the good deeds you're promising in uh, new, new uh, countries. Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, actually, let's take a look at that video right now, and then we're going we're gonna to come back sure. uh, and uh, have some final thoughts from you. And uh, I'm so happy for all these uh, viewers uh, and these comments. Thanks so much. If anybody uh, has, a, has a question for Ivana, uh, maybe yeah, you please. can put it in the comments, and we'll take one, one or two of those uh, when we come back after watching the uh, it's just IDP. It's the original, right? Before the first. They're one. both called IDP Africa. Oh, just okay. completely different versions. Okay. Which you'll see. Let's take a look at. Uh, let, let's take a look at this version of it. Good evening. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the land on which we stand is the traditional territory of the Lenape tribal community. Thank you for taking care of this land for thousands of years. Thank you. They took care of this land for, for thousands of years. For us, and I'm so grateful. Welcome to our gorgeous one year anniversary party. As most of you know, my name is Ivana Dizdar and I am the founding director and CEO of Ivana Dizdar Projects, which operates out of Toronto and New York and more recently, East Asia and Western Europe, with locations in Beijing and Paris. Originally, we were focused on modern and contemporary art primarily, but we're gonna start collecting and distributing work from around the globe, both uh, ancient and pre-modern art, uh, tribal and civilized. I'm absolutely thrilled to announce that IDP will be expanding to Africa with a new location in Ugumbwai by May of 2020. I am so excited to bring a piece of North America and Western Europe to Africa and to have IDP begin a chapter in the third world. I think the building is going to be an architectural masterpiece. It's gonna be like, like a beautiful work of art in and of itself in the Ugwambian jungle. It'll be seamlessly integrated into the landscape, but also stand in, in interesting contrast with the surrounding slums. By the time IDP Uguambia opens in 2020, we will have appointed a globally-minded board of directors and appointed international curators from cities like New York, Paris, Berlin, London, Beijing, Tokyo, and Johannesburg. 
As always, IDP will be an equal opportunity employer with a commitment to all kinds of diversity. Within a year of our ribbon cutting ceremony, we will open a high-end hotel in Uguambia, as well as a 65,000 square foot sculpture garden surrounding the gallery. Oh, and by 2022, IDP will develop into a fully functional, all-inclusive resort with a water park, a man-made beach, and a diverse range of entertainment and shopping, you name it, we'll have it all. Five years from the gallery's opening, we will launch the first ever Dizdar Biennale. Dizdar Biennale. And we'll also be launching an accredited university with an MA program in curatorial studies, an MFA in visual art, and a pilot MBA with an emphasis on art world business. Meanwhile, the resort will continue to expand in a number of ways, among them through the construction of a 25,000 square foot zoo, which will include both local and exotic animals. By 2030, we plan to have a mid-sized airport so that visitors can fly directly to Uguambia. And by 2032, we will have such a breadth of physical and administrative resources, we will have the capacity even to host that year's Summer Olympics. In the near future, we anticipate reaching 1,000 visitors a day on average. That's 30,000 visitors a month, 350 a year, more than five times of any other museum in the whole region. There are both local and national benefits to the new institution, including cultural tourism, employment, especially for the low-income majority, uh, small and large business growth, third-party investment, and uh, offshore banking. <laughs> IDP Uguambia is moreover poised to be a leader by example. Its emphasis on new technologies, sophisticated modes of business exchange, and a commitment to high-level international relations are sure to inspire and motivate the local peoples. Of course, most importantly, our trajectory includes increasingly developed social initiatives. From the numerous charities that we donate to on a regular basis to our very own American Friends Foundation, we will contribute to building schools in Africa, educating local communities, and fundraising for research on AIDS. I'd especially like to extend my deepest, deepest gratitude to our corporate sponsor, Progressive Oil Inc whose dedication to the arts really parallels their dedication to the natural resources of Uguambia. Um, I'm just so grateful to them, you know, for allowing us to be an institutional advocate for the arts, for social change, and by extension, for, for human rights and freedoms. Thank you for allowing us to lead the way for future generations to make the world a better place. Thank you. All right, there we go. Uh, <clears throat> IDP Africa, the, uh, the other version of it. We saw both of them here today. Um, we do, uh, I, this is a question too, I was trying to figure out, we do have one question, which, which one of the IDP Africa videos did you make first? The cell phone leaking, leak? The one you just played. That one was first, and then so yes. uh, the cell phone one uh, came, came later. Um, so exactly, I made them all in the same period within a few weeks of each other. Okay. But the one you just played came first, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I'm just kind of curious, like, uh, I know you're kind of quarantined and 
Toronto, but uh, what I know, and I also know you have a one or two projects uh, you're not really uh, ready to, to speak about because you don't want to give them away. And you're also, as you mentioned at the beginning of the show, involved with uh, some uh, pretty big curatorial projects. But uh, what what are what are you? Can you give us a little taste of what you're working on? Is what we can see in the future, uh, kind of a continuing this trajectory or uh, something a little different? For sure. Well, I am working on another character, I will say that. But the reason I don't want to talk about it too much is because I don't want to break the illusion. Uh, but some of you will be seeing her. Um, you definitely will, Scott. And as for the kind of work that I'm thinking about, the, the art and law very much. So I, I want to make the kind of work that actually does something out in, in the world. Do you know what I mean when I say that? That isn't just art about art or art for art's sake or art that looks good, but that is actually doing something and affecting people in a real way. And I also really continue to be insistent on making art that will resonate with people uh, regardless of their pre-existing knowledge or interest in art. And that's what I'm always trying to do. Um, so that that is what I can say for now. But my new character will be coming shortly. Well, that's exciting. I really, really anticipate what you've uh, what you're what you're gonna do. Uh, please do uh, let me know when you feel like you can. I'd love to to know. Uh, we've worked together, I think, uh, two or three times. I showed uh, bidding war that you made with Alvin at uh, Sluice Art Fair in London a few years ago. Uh, when I was there with Amy Lockhart, who's uh, on our show next week. And uh, what else? Oh, we. I, uh, Stockholm. Uh, yeah, that's right. Just I uh, wasn't there. I wasn't there myself. But uh, Angel Calendar uh, curated your work at the Supermarket Art Fair about uh, almost exactly one year ago, right now, um, which was a fabulous, uh, incredible booth. Uh, from the pictures I saw, I thought it was maybe the best booth at the fair. Uh, it was. <laughs> and then uh, also you allowed uh, allowed me to put uh, one of your videos into an uh, ongoing uh, program on Bump TV, Bump Television out of Toronto. If any of our viewers uh, want to see some more experimental work, you can tune in to Bump Television 24 hours a day. Uh, and I, I can't remember when our program plays. I think they bumped it from a primo Monday afternoon slot to a late night Saturday. Uh, that's okay. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> I just want to kind of finish off now and say thank you very, very much for taking this time to, to talk to me about your ideas and also allow uh, me to stream your videos on YouTube. Um, and I hope that uh, you're, you're doing well and uh, you're feeling as positive as possible, as are our viewers. Uh, so thank, thank you so much, uh, Ivana, so much. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for having me. It's always such a treat to talk to you. I'm really glad that we did this. It's, it's been too long, and uh, I look forward to uh, when we can see each other in real life again sometime in the future as well, and maybe uh, we'll work towards another, another project, and maybe in 10 years, we'll, uh, maybe I'll work for you when you uh, fully realize your giant uh, IDP international conglomerate of uh, Bluetooth art galleries. If you're lucky. We'll see. I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> okay. Take care, and we'll talk soon. Bye, Scott. Thanks, Thanks. so much. <laughs> So that was a great chat. It was fantastic to, uh, to talk with my, my friend and colleague, Ivana Dizdar, about uh, all of her work and, in per and more in particular about uh, all of her ideas around, around that work. I've um, always been sort of curious. I've never really uh, had the chance to, uh, to ask her a lot of those questions because uh, we're always seeing each other sort of in passing uh, in different uh, circumstances. I uh, hope everyone, thanks so much for so many people uh, watching the show today. If you're, if it's the first time you're watching it, this show is called Open Circuit. Uh, we're streaming here from Ed Video every weekday at 2 p.m., speaking with artists uh, about their work, showing their work, just trying to do uh, what we can to, you know, keep things going, whether that's like a, you know, a distraction for people or, uh, or it could even be just something you sort of listen to in the background, like a podcast. Um, uh, I hope you're enjoying it. Thanks so much for all your comments, too. We have some really great shows coming up next week uh, and in the following weeks, too, talking with all different types of uh, media artists and other people doing interesting things. Uh, normally, my daughter Edie is here uh, joining me uh, on the show, but she's, uh, she's at home today, but she will be back on Monday. Uh, 
doing some uh, video game reviews. Uh, I hope everyone has a, a great weekend. We're just going to end up the end off the show right here. Uh, normally, Edie plays uh, the music on her keyboard, but she's not here, so we're just I'm just going to uh, use some tracks from uh, from Ed Video member Evan Gordon's project Sled. Take care, everyone. Be safe and uh, enjoy enjoy your weekend. See you later. Slide. Soon I will be dancing all across the road.